Yet a she barber teller or lalas in she, de isha deja linda teller peat. Will ye, um, top by he need long talk head lini bashil chain. Hat no lightning than he null as cheatney than his she. I do but that so that need ash. Sam do root teller in him but on his she, deed out son and needle. Good evening. My name is Linda Teller Pete, and this is my sister Barbara Teller Ornalis. Uh, Barbara just introduced us in Navajo. Our clans are Edgewater and Two Waters That Flow Together. This is how we introduce ourselves as Navajo people, and it's also to establish kinship with the audience and see uh, how we can um, uh, relate to one another, and that's, uh, that's how we do our introductions. Say, so in our family, um, these are the current weavers that we have, myself, uh, my sister Linda Teller-Pete, uh, my son Michael Teller-Ornalis, and my daughter Sierra Teller-Ornalis, and our granddaughter Roxanne Teller-Lee. And then our toolmaker is uh, my sister's husband, Belvin Pete, uh, who is an um, electrical engineer? Mechanical. Mechanical engineer. So... Our first generation is uh, um, we have no recordings of her, no photos of her work, and um, but she was the very first one that was recorded after Bosco Redondo. And then we have our second generation, which is our great-grandmother, uh, the Natsui Butsi. She didn't have an English name, and um, and then but she was a great, excellent weaver. And then the next person is our grandmother, Susie Tom, who is our mom's mom. And uh, her uh, her mom used, um, used to collaborate on big pieces together. The large rug that you see behind the slide where our our two uh, grandmothers are is actually uh, housed at the Tallina uh, trading post up in uh Tallina, New Mexico. And uh, that large rug is was actually done probably in the late um, uh, 1940s, maybe early 1950s. I'm not really sure, but it has color. It's it, it was during the time frame when Tugra Hills was morphing into its now design. So the, the large tapestry that you see behind them has a little bit of turquoise, it has a little bit of yellow and a little bit of red in it. And the photo that we have is in black and white, but uh, there is a colored uh, version of it um, that that we have available. And, uh, and it's really good to know that we can see it any time that we return home. In our family, we have um, my two maternal aunts, Margaret Yazzie and Mary Louise Gould. They both have um, been weaving along with my, my mom as they were growing up. Mary Louise is the youngest aunt, and she came from a, a, a second set of family. My, my grandmother had remarried, and so the first three girls were my Aunt Marie and my Aunt Margaret. And so my mom always hung out with my aunt Margaret and uh, they remained very close up until my mom passed away in 2014. All, all of my aunt's children, my cousins, they all know how to weave. And so our whole community was made out of um, weaving, uh, weaving people. <laughs> And uh, one thing that is real different in our community is that our uncles never left our our community. And in, traditionally, in Navajo families, uh, Navajo men, when they get married, they move to their wife's homeland. And uh, but in our community, because we're two Greyhill weavers, the the in laws would want to move to our community because they wanted to learn how to weave our way. And the Two Gray Hill Way is considered the most uh, expensive, um, and it garners a lot of income for them. And so that's why the in-laws um, would come. And it was up to my grandmother to teach them how to weave. So the next slide is our sister, Roseanne um, Teller Lee. Um, I always get asked, who is the best weaver in your family? And I always say it was my sister, Roseanne, because... She was an amazing person. Her skill level, her techniques, everything was beyond, you know, what we all knew how to do. And um, 
she, um, because our mom was always uh, weaving and demonstrating for the trading post, it was left to her to teach us um, uh, the, the weaving. And she used to walk around with a yardstick and she would make me and Lynn um, weave an inch all the way across. And then she would measure and like to, you know, six or seven different places to make sure the inch was all the way across. And if, if we didn't reach that, she would make us either take it out or build more to make sure it was completely even. And she was really uh, a, a disciplinary when it came to designs. We had to make sure that there was no open spaces in our work. She always made sure that we had to have designs in every part of the weaving that we did. And she was a very stickler for that. And I always tell the, the two stories I have about her is um, one uh, was um, she had just finished a piece and we took it to Shabrat Trading Post. And we were waiting in line because there was a woman ahead of us who was selling her piece. And she... Um, she sold her piece to the to the trading post and then as we went in because it was our turn we went in and um he picked up that rug he had just bought rolled it up and then tossed it in the garbage and my sister was like what are you doing you know and he goes you know she he goes i love that woman and her family i know they need the money and i buy everything she brings me but i can't sell them and so roseanne dug it back it out back out of the garbage and looked at it and she goes if I fix this while well, you buy it from me and the rug was beautiful at the bottom but it started to come in and it had like the, the shape of a backpack you know and the guy just laughed and he says if you can fix it I'll buy it from you you know just laughing about it so she took it home and then she put it back up on the loom and she unwove it all the way where you know, the um, the weaving started to go in. She unwove it all the way down and then rewove it completely and, you know, cleaned it and everything, and we took it back. And he was amazed. He was just like, how did, how did you do this, you know? And he goes, I have a lot more weaving you can fix for me. And she's like, nope, this is a one-time deal, you know? <laughs> and uh, it was just amazing to me how she came up with the idea and how she fixed it. The other story I have about her was um, she's the, her and her husband used to live in this little tiny trailer uh, because he was a construction worker and they would follow the the work and and um, so she had very little room to to weave her pieces and um, she would take her big loom outside at nighttime and then during the, during the day she would bring it in and, and work on it. But her knees was always up against the the weaving, you know. So she's always careful sitting in front of it, putting her knees on it and weaving. And the one time she forgot, she just sat really fast in front of the her her weaving and put her knees up against the, the weaving. And the weaving broke, her warp broke all the way across and left an inch. And she was just devastated you know my mom I and mean, she was crying to my mom my mom's like why are you crying you're the only one who can fix this <laughs> you know so for me i would have started from the the one end where it was broken and just did one line all the way across but she didn't do that she put one in the middle one on the side and she just crisscrossed like that until she replaced every single one and the reason why she did that was because if I had just one, if she had just started on one side, weaving everything in, it would have had, it would have been very bulky. And um, but the way she did it, the the weaving, the weft was able to stretch just enough for the warp to be uh, sewn back in, you know. And then when she finished the piece, it was like she never ever tore that piece it was you know amazing and uh, you know I feel I feel like I'm a great weaver and I can troubleshoot really well but I could never do what she did she was she was amazing um 
I just want to add also that with Roseanne, we lost her in 1996, along with her uh, son and her youngest son and her grandson um, uh, in 1996. And that was a really, really dark period for all of us. And we didn't weave for a really long time until our mother uh, called us home and uh, she said, you know, these are Roseanne's weaving tools and we're going to separate them. And you guys are going to process your grief. And she was right. That was a way back for us to get back into weaving. And, um, you know, my sister, Roseanne, is probably um, one of the greatest mentors there ever was for Navajo weavers in our community. A lot of people went to her. Not only was she skilled in weaving, but she had she had like three different jobs. She was a bus driver. She uh, worked at the um, uh, local trading post. She um, owned a little little bistro that she would um, set out when she needed to um, get in between her weavings, uh, you know, income for her weavings in between. And um, she, her designs were so distinctive that I can walk into a gallery or any place where her weavings are and I can pick them out. I, I walk up to it and I say, this is my sister's work. And a lot of times they're like, oh, how do you know? And I go, I know. I know because she was very inventive with her designs and her color combinations. And one thing that she used to say to Barbara and me was, you're only as good as your last weaving. Meaning, you guys may get all the awards, you may get, you know, accolades and, you know, all, all kinds of compliments for our weaving, but we should never cut corners. That the last piece that we work on has to be as perfect as possible and that we need to increase that perfection through all of our weaving, that we never should slack off. And I remember her words, uh, Barbara remembers those words, and that, that's something we live by today. Next slide is our, our mom, um, Ruth Teller. She is the middle child of the first family of my grandmother. Our, her father passed away, and so my grandmother remarried. But she and her sisters often accompanied our grandmother, Susie Tom, to people's houses and, uh, and learned how to, uh, uh, and, and watched her mother fix, uh, fix and finish rugs for people, for, for weavers in our area. And uh, for all those years, she learned how to troubleshoot. She learned how to um, uh, go in and, and fix her own rugs and our own rugs. And uh, she became very well known in our community for fixing those problems. And uh, she uh, married my father. And um, consequently, we lived at uh, Newcomb, New Mexico for the summers. And then in the wintertime, we spent um, our, our time up at the Two Gray Hill Trading Post where my father worked for 35 years. So we have been surrounded by the rug business for you know, most of our lives. And uh, our mother used to demonstrate at the trading post and she um, wasn't well known. Her weavings did not appear in a lot of publications because most of her rugs uh, were sold off the loom. We used to get tour buses that w would come to the Two Gray Hill Trading Post. And these tours would come off the buses and then look around and say, hey, I don't see, you know, weavers uh, weaving under trees. And my father would say, well, you know, those are photo ops. Uh, most weavers weave in their homes and that's probably what they're doing right now. But if you want to see someone weaving, come to the back of the store and see my wife. And most tourists would go and look. And one of the things that we remember from our childhood is that we would get photos or books or newspapers from different countries with our mom's weavings. And so we know that her rugs, her tapestries were sold all over the world. And, um, and one thing that our mother was really well known for was um, being a photographer. She used to have um, uh, a camera around her neck all the time. And in those days, you know, the, the top of the line cameras were probably Instamatics. And so she had this small little camera 
and she would take photos of the weavers that would come to our house. And uh, she would have two matching dresses made out, out, made out of red gingham uh, for Barbara and me. She would hang them in the back of the, the front door. And as weavers would come up, she would make us put our dresses on. We would go outside and we would hold up uh, uh, people's rugs for them. And my mother would take three photos. She would take one for herself, take one for the weaver, and take one for the um, uh, to remain with the rug as it was being sold. And so she really um, uh, taught us, you know, archiving and recording your history. And, you know, our mother lived until um, 87. And even as the dementia was overtaking her, she would look at magazines and books and would point to the photo and then point to herself, you know, as her as as her voice uh, deteriorated. And so we know that she was really still um, uh, having weaving on her mind at that point. So back in 1983. Um, My sister, Roseanne, had just finished a piece, and we took it to Shiprock Trading Post. And um, the the store owner told us that um, people are not buying Navajo weavings anymore. Uh, Nobody's really interested in in what we have. He goes, I have a vault full of, of, of your weavings, and I can't seem to move them. You know, he goes, something needs to happen for um, uh, for people to remember that the Navajo weavers are still here. And so he, he, you know, he really liked my sister, so he went ahead and bought her piece. And as we were driving home, we were kind of brainstorming, like, what should we do, you know, maybe have like a Navajo weaving show, maybe, you know, just coming up with ideas. And we get home to our mom's house, and we were telling mom what had happened and what the store owner had said. And, um, and mom goes, why don't you guys make a big piece? You know, a very large piece. And I'm like, that's been done before, you know. And, I mean, you see big pieces everywhere, like the Chichimbito rug and the, um, you know, the the huge rug in Winslow. And, you know, they're all famous weavings. And then our mom says, but not in tapestry form. You know, those rugs are made with heavy, heavy wool. The, The weaving that you could do is fine, like what we what we work with. And so it took us um, nine nine months of wool preparation, and then it took us two weeks of warping the the loom, and it was five feet across and nine feet long, and it took us two and a half years of actual weaving time, but the rug stood on the loom for four years. And um, one year we didn't work on it because my sister was mad at me. And she sold. She's she hit all the warp ball, uh, uh, the yarn ball, so I couldn't uh, weave on it by, by myself. So, but you know, our mom threatened to finish the piece, and and uh, so we had to come back together and finish it. And I had been going to Santa Fe Indie Market at that time for about three, four years, and and you know, you see all these beautiful um, art pieces winning best of show. And and then they, um, you know, they would um, um, get all these uh, um, awards and uh, all the recognition and, you know, and I wanted to see how our, our weaving would do against that. And so I told my sister about it. And we had finished the piece like in March and we housed it at uh, the Herd Museum in their vault to make sure, you know, it stays safe and it wasn't in either of our homes and so um, we we went to Indi- uh, Santa Fe and we applied for Roseanne to, to for her to get um, juried in, and so she got in right away because you know she's a master, and so we we um, we took the rug in, and um, not really expecting anything but hopeful, you know. So we took the rug in and then. You know, 26 out of 28 judges voted for our piece for Best of Show. So we got Best of Show, Best in Divi- Classification, Best in Division, First Place, and then Excellent in Traditional Weaving. And so it had five ribbons, and it was 
truly amazing. I mean, you know, when my sister and I were working on that piece, we both had dreams. You know, she wanted uh, to buy a house for herself and her boys. And I wanted to, you know, have an easier life putting an ex-husband through pharmacy school and raising my own children. And, you know, and so... And the night before all this happened, after we won Best of Show, um, we couldn't sleep, you know, so that we stayed up all night. And 3 o'clock in the morning, we were at Denny's because <laughs> we couldn't sleep. And we were talking about the price, what we're going to ask for. And, you know, and my sister's, you know, she's pretty bold when she wants to be. And so she was like, I'm going to ask for this amount of money because I want this, I want that. And she wanted visitation rights and she wanted to see where the rug was going to go and, you know, all these things. And and so the next morning we get to the, I told her that I'm going to go get the, the weaving and I'll be right back. So they were putting up the, um, the, um, uh, you know, our booth stuff and her husband and my husband were putting up the booth stuff and this lady was sitting there in a chair and she said I spent the night here and she goes I'm first in line I'm like oh okay thank you and I just kind of did um what my mom used to do was take a camera and and start taking photos so I took photos of the sheep and all the carding all, all the spinning and you know, every time we did six inches, I took a photo of it, you know, and I just kind of put a, a whole picture book together and I handed it to her and I told her this is kind of like the history of, you know, what we did. And then um, I, I told her I'm going to go get the, the weaving. So I left and I went to uh, that time. The best of show was at the Laredo. And so I picked it up and on my way back. All these Navajo artists were coming out of their booth and clapping. And they were like, it's great to be in Navajo today, you know. And it was just, it was an amazing feel and sight for that, you know, for, for that moment. And so I get back to my booth and that woman was crying. She, because um, she had been looking through the book. And then she said, I don't care what you want for that piece. That piece is mine. Right. So I told my sister, Roseanne, I go, go ahead, tell her what you want. <laughs> you know, just talk to her. And she couldn't do it. She was just she was, I guess, shocked and stunned, you know, that somebody would say that they wanted to take the piece. So I put on a brave front and I said, well, OK, my sister and I've been talking about this and we want 60,000 for this piece. I'm expecting her to say, okay, thanks, but no thanks. And they give me my book back and turn around and walk away. But she didn't. Her husband came up behind her and said, how do you want it? Cash, check, credit card. <laughs> and then I'm like, talk to my husband here. They talk to him, you know. So, But in the end, you know, he bought us plane tickets. We were able to go to Houston. He showed us where the wall where it was going to be hung, the wall where it's going to be hung. And, you know, he, he said, anytime you guys want to come visit, more than welcome to come. And he became such a great, great friend and and one of our huge um, collectors, because after that, he collected a lot of Roseanne's and he collected a lot of my pieces. And in his home, the, the rug stood on, uh, w w hung on the wall. On one side was all Roseanne's pieces. On the other side was all my pieces. And it was it was like like a sweeping staircase, and there it was, and this beautiful. And then you know, people always ask me, you know, people always ask, one, if you if, they, if you ever had a chance to relive um, some parts of your life, what would it be? For me, it would have been that weekend because it was really really special, and because the weaving got so much publicity. I mean, we were like on every. TV stations you could think of and, you know, and every print magazines you could think of. I may even made like Wall Street Journal and Business Week and, <laughs> you know, all those places where you never expect to see Indian art. And 
it made such a huge splash that people started to remember that Navajo weaving still exists. And then, you know, you'll see in a lot of the Navajo weaving books, they'll say, you know, in the winter of 1987, people started coming back buying, you know, and that's all because of the big, big rug. Yeah. Okay, so that big tapestry um, has... It, it's still an infamy. People come to our booth to this day and they'll say, then you guys went on this big rug like, you know, and um, several years ago. And they are shocked when we tell them it's 1987. <laughs> and they're like, wow, I remember that day. You know, I was here or whatever. And, um, you know, and it sold for $60,000 in, in uh, 1987. And today's dollars, it is $158,000. That's what it would have sold for. Uh, in, in today's dollars. And it also made a benchmark for weavers from then on to get more money for their work. Also, weavers started to sell on their own directly to collectors and not have a middleman because the money that my sisters made, all of it went to them and not, um, and, and, and didn't have to pay a middleman, uh, um, you know, a quarter or even half of their earnings. And each of them uh, really improved their lives with that. And, you know, the rug business is really um, like feast or famine. And and one and in certain cases, one tapestry will literally change the course of your life. And this was it for them. Uh, the next slide shows a photo of Barbara's 1991 uh, Best of Show. She in, uh, she um, did this weaving all by herself this time, a solo effort, and she made it while she was living in student housing on the campus of the um, University of Arizona in Tucson. And because her apartment was so small, her large loom um, had to be carried out and taken to the common room. And she had to rent that whole common room for a weekend to do her finishing touches. And so she had, you know, her kids were still really small. And uh, she took that rug off and, and did it all by herself. And then it took um, uh, the best of show in 1991. And um, one of the things that she... Um, proceeded to do was really go on and and um, get into other types of weaving. And from her beginnings, she really had a hard time trying to get respect from um, the collectors and from gallery owners and things like that. She had a really hard time starting out. Uh, and I think it was the early 80s when she moved to Phoenix. And um, she had a hard time trying to sell to galleries. And so our dad finally had to step in and tell her, you know, there's a, a, a new trader that's opening up a, a trading, a, a, a gallery in Scottsdale, Arizona. And um, um, Scottsdale is kind of like a well-heeled, um, disposable income kind of area. And so Barbara went to go see Joe Tanner there. And he did not want to see her weavings at first, but she mentioned, you know, who her dad was. And he finally said, okay, yeah, well, I'll take a look, but I won't be able to buy it. You know, with that mindset, you know, <laughs> you're really up against the, the wall there. And so uh, he looked at her weavings and he said, okay, I will take it on consignment. But if they don't sell in two days, you're going to have to come and pick them up. And so two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, so he said, if your weavings don't sell in two weeks, you have to come back and pick them up. But uh, a couple of days later, he called her up and said, you know, both rugs have sold, so come and pick up your check. And so she did that, and he asked for more pieces. And so she kept, you know, it was a good relationship for a while until he told her, you know what, you're too good for this. So you should go down to the Herd Museum because there's an upcoming art show. And so not knowing the ins and outs of what an art show entails, Barbara just shows up at uh, the Herd's, uh, Herd Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. And they have an annual Indian market, um, usually the first weekend in March. So she went in there and asked for a table. And uh, this lady um, by the name of Peggy Fairchild 
comes out and says, you can't do that. These people, <laughs> these native artists have turned in applications. They've been juried in. They've submitted, you know, slides of their work. And, you you know, um, you can't just come in the day of and ask for a table. And so Barbara was dejected and she was ready to leave. And then uh, Peggy said, wait a minute, but what do you do? And she says, I'm a weaver. And as most art shows, you know, our number of weavers are very limited. And so um, they didn't have that many weavers at the herd at that time. And so she said, let me look at it. And so Barbara put out her weavings and she said, well, we never do this, but I'm going to get you a table. And if you have a loom, I'd like for you to demonstrate. And Barbara did have a loom in her car. So she went to go pick it up, brought it in and set up a table and she was able to sell her her weavings there. And uh, Peggy then had a lasting relationship with Barbara and she guided Barbara through four years of residency at the Herd Museum. And she called on Barbara when big donors would come in, she would call her on her to to lead some tours and things like that. And so um, one thing that uh, Barbara was very concerned about was her young children. And Michael back then was still an infant in a cradle board. And so she told Peggy that I have children. I don't, you know, uh, I don't have a babysitter. And Peggy said, well, just dress them up and bring them. And so Barbara uh, did that. And at times she would have to put a sign on, on Michael's cradle board saying, it's a real baby, don't touch him. And um, uh, that way, you know, uh, tourists would come and, and take a look. And so the, both kids grew up there, uh, Barbara, I mean, uh, Michael and Sierra. And Michael started learning how to walk there. He would climb up the stairs and, and then people would freak out and go, oh, there's a baby crawling up the stairs. And then the security guard would come over, bring Michael back down. And, you know, so the kids grew up around museums. And um, um, the the museum people also got her to travel to England um, for a um, a residency at the Museum of Man, which is part of the British Museum. And, uh, and both kids were still small when they did that. And so it took her a really long time to get the, the, um, uh, the respect um, as a weaver and to to get noted for her her art and not just crafting like women's work. That was a big distinction that people would make. And she also really struggled to to sell directly to collectors. You know, she um, her husband helped her put together a profile um, portfolio, um, made her business cards, and really helped her build her business. And uh, to this day, we still we still do that type of marketing. And it was all due to her former husband David. And um, um, the other thing that that Barbara started pushing herself to do was to get into diverse arts. And this is all due to her kids, you know, her, her, uh, Michael and Sierra has been really, um, uh, they broke away from the, the pigeonhole of being regional weavers because they didn't grow up like that. Barbara and I were pigeonholed as two Gray Hill weavers, but her kids have had more free will. And so they wove what was in their environment. And one thing that um, Barbara always pushed was, you know, just, just weave. As long as you're weaving, you're fine. And, um, and that, that's one thing that we um, uh, still say to this day to our granddaughter, Roxanne. And so as Barbara started working with the museums. She started looking at period pieces. She started looking at other regional styles and tourists that would come to the museum would say, I would like a rug, but you know, like as fine as yours, but I want it in burnt water, which is photographed here. And, uh, or they would want like a, um, a first phase, second phase, third phase, 1980 period pieces. And she would do that. She started doing child's blankets. And um, the other historic pieces that she started doing is the Moki. And that this particular Moki on here, she traded it with an orthodontist for Michael's uh, braces. And so there's, and, and then there's another um, uh, super supermarket owner named Eddie Basha, who wanted a large piece from her. And so she traded him for um, a large gift card for groceries that she would 
just go into a store. And I think it lasted her for four years. <laughs> and um, so, you know, we still adhere to um, the, the old trade days, the old trade days as well. And um, my journey is, is a little bit different where I, um, um, when I grew up weaving, Barbara and I used to sit uh, facing each other like our dad made these huge looms for us and they were braced on top and so Barbara sat facing me and you know th that's great for uh, siblings that get along um, and then we have like an arsenal of tools right so we have these battens and 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 on days I was very bratty, I would push it through and try to poke her with it, and which is really a taboo. You you guys shouldn't try that. Um, <laughs> but um, our our mother would come in after we have been squabbling for a while, and she would try to uh, she would put a sheet in between us so we wouldn't look at each other. And so both of us got our start probably around age six, and we were typically uh, two gray hill. Uh, weavers. And um, I would say that when Barbara branched out, it did not delight my mother. <laughs> um, it also, uh, our aunts were very concerned. And so when Barbara came home, they said, we need to have an intervention. <laughs> and, but she said, I have to weave to feed my family. And so that's why she branched out. And after watching her branch out and after watching Barbara's kids, um, with whom you'll hear about later, I really started branching out. And when I started working with museums, I was looking at period pieces of child's blankets and things like that. And that inspired me. And then using um, the dyes as well. And I was weaving for a long time. Um, and after I quit my full-time job in 2010, Barbara encouraged me to enter um, Santa Fe Indian Market. And in 2000, in the year 2000, I entered, but not in textiles. I entered as a bead artist, and I was beading these uh, full velvet sets of clothing. And I was known as a beader. People would would come to our booth and buy my beadwork, and then. Barbara kept after me saying, you need to enter a textile piece. You need to do it. And I kept saying, you know, they know you as a weaver. They know Michael's a weaver. They know Sierra's a weaver. I really don't want to compete. And she said, you're not competing. You need to do this because this is what you took on when our sister passed away. And so I took it as um, good advice. And in 2004, um, 2002, I finally entered my two gray. And much to my surprise, I won a blue ribbon and Barbara took second. <laughs> and I thought, that's a fluke. It's never going to happen again. So I am going to shout it from the mountaintops <laughs> that I have a blue ribbon. And, um, it, you know, and, and that was very encouraging for me because it, when in our booth we have um, right now we we only have three three of us that are that are uh, weaving full time and that's uh, Barbara Michael and me and when one of us wins we all win because that draws people to our booth and um, and usually in our booth we wait for uh, the first customer to come up that buys um, one of our pieces. And that person has to buy dinner for everybody. And so we, we, have, um, we, we also have these like little bingo cards about the weirdest questions that we get. And so weaving has really bonded us and it has inspired us. It has motivated us. And we really look to each other for um, it, uh, uh, it, not to just troubleshoot, but also what's your next project? Because one thing that Roseanne used to say to us, because she taught us quality control, is you are only as good as your last piece. And she's right. Because once you start to believe all the ribbons, and Barbara keeps like six boot uh, boxes of her ribbons. And, you know, she gets a ribbon and she tosses it in there. And she says, you don't have to always believe that 
um, the ribbons, you know, make you a superior weaver. It's the weaving that speaks for itself. The weaving has a life. And we put our um, our tears, we put our laughter, we put our bonding and our conversations. We talk about our um, our ancestors and we go through our mother's books and our sister's weavings and we use their tools. So when a person buys our tapestry, they're not just buying a work of art, they're also buying our stories and the blessing that it comes with that it displays. And so we, we put all that into our work and um, I'm sorry, I'm watching the time because my, my <laughs> niece is going to come on soon. <laughs> um, and so, and so we, um, when we started working with museums, um, we, when we started, Barbara actually started out probably in the eighties and um, she, she, um, was called upon actually just to say yes to questions, to say yes to written things. And now it's different. You know, it is now um, 2023 and the curators have gotten younger and the curators have become um, uh, much more uh, open for us to uh, speak our truths and we're really grateful to the BART Center because what we put into this exhibition uh, using our words and creating space for us is a lot different than what we were used to. And we hope that the younger generation take that upon um, uh, all these new spaces that have been created. And uh, um, Hadley, again, is working with me on another project in New Mexico, in Santa Fe, at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. And that exhibit will open on July 16th, 2023, and it's called Horizons Woven Between the Lines. And we have a group of very young um, Navajo scholars, Navajo uh, uh, photographer Raphael Begay. We have um, Larissa Naz, who has lended her voice to uh, give us the meaning of Navajo weaving. And so we're, uh, we're very um, proud of the new uh, uh, directions that we have gone. Sierra, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, it's a mom. How's it going? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, before I start, yeah, a Sierra Nelson and Shea, Tabah Nishle, Nakatne Bashin, Twahazin is Che Do Nakatine Additionally. As my mom and aunt have said before, my name is Sierra Taylor Arnellis. I am a member of the Navajo Nation, no big deal. I am um, Edgewater, <laughs> born for the Mexican clan, and uh, I am the co-creator and showrunner of Rutherford Falls and uh, was a writer on a lot of other TV shows. Thanks so much for having me here today. I'm also Bobby's daughter, so <laughs> <laughs> the most important job. It's my daughter, Sierra. <laughs> I'm very, very proud of my daughter. She's just an amazing, amazing person. Um, she, um, I started her out probably when you were like four, four five, weavy. Uh, and yeah, you just, took me to um, the Dillard's restaurant. Yeah, and I was like five or six, and you were like. We need to talk. And I thought I was getting fired, which is weird because I was a child. Um, and uh, she was like, You're, we need to get your hands ready for weaving. And so I started out originally making beadwork um, mm -hmm. and learning how to bead so that my hands would kind of get nimble. And then I started um, weaving uh, at a pretty young age. It was a lot of pressure because I was one of maybe two women or girls born in a generation of boys. And for Navajos, if you're a weaver, you really want to have girls. And so I remember I still have this like vision of me at the loom and I was looking up and it was like my mom, my grandma and all my aunts just like staring at me and it was terrifying. Um, but, but they were always like really supportive and, and really it was weaving was such a big part of our lives. Um, like my mom talks a lot about waking up to the sound of weaving and it was the same for me and my brother where we would wake up to the sound of her weaving, we'd go to sleep to the sound of her weaving. Mm -hmm. And so it was very much like kind of a given that that was what you were gonna, gonna do in your life, even if it wasn't your job. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, But she was always interested in TVs 
you know, TV show. And as a really young, young girl, I'm, I tried to get her to go to bed and she goes, no, mom, I'm researching, you know? Yeah. And so she would let us watch. We were like binge watching before that was a thing. So we would like <laughs> go to Blockbuster and get all the new releases. But my parents were kind of art snobs, I would say a little bit. And so they would have like taste of like what you should watch and what you shouldn't watch. And, and so my mom would say like, go get, you know, the, I remember at the swap meet, you found the show soap on DVD and we watched both seasons in like a night (laughs) or like the first time I ever saw the sunrise was because we watched, um, Fiddler on the Roof, A Chorus Line, and West Side Story. (laughs) And my mom wove all night, and I watched those movies. And so a lot of core memories of really great movies and television were sort of burnt into my brain while she was weaving. Or while summertime, it was like you could stay up as late as you wanted if you were beating or if you were weaving. And so I got to watch a lot of TV and a lot of um, movies. But I always noticed the writers at the end who created the show. And um, I couldn't pronounce their names, but I, I always, like, still now, I'll see them sometimes at like wj meetings or something and i'm like oh my god um and if there was a woman writer i like really paid attention Mm -hmm. to just know that they existed you know but my mom was a really great storyteller so also too like while you were weaving there was there's so much great gossip you know happening in the booth and um while you're weaving Sometimes you are fighting the way my aunt was describing, but a lot of times it's like, did you hear what happened to such and such or so-and-so is cheating on so-and-so? And And so if you hung out by the loom, you'd get like the best stories and the best gossip. And so it was always a place for storytelling, I think, as much as it was, you know, uh, weaving. Yeah. You know, and I encourage her and her uh, her brother to uh, make up stories. You know, we would do on these long car trips and I would, you know, uh, we would pick three th- different things. I said, give me a story on these th- three different things. And she was, she was really good at that. You know, she was really good at making up stories and stuff. And when I was um, really upset with her sometimes, and she'll just start telling me these outrageous stories <laughs> just to get me to laugh, you know, so I, I won't be so mad at her anymore, you know. And I always remember her doing that as, as a, you know, a child. And um, she um, gravitated more towards words. And I always tell her that because you're kind of going that way because your great-grandfather was a storyteller when they came back from Bosco they asked him what he did you know what was his job and he said I can't I'm a story I tell stories I'm a storyteller and a keeper of stories and so that's how our last name became teller you know and I said that's what you carry that's you know you're not only you know weaving your 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 um, tapestries you're also weaving with your words and uh, and it just seems that to me, you know, I don't know how she feels about it, but writing came real easy for her. And, and you know, people in high school, uh, her teachers will always say they can't wait for her stories to show up, you know, because they're really interested. And even in college, they were anxious about her stories because they wanted to really hear what she had to say and stuff. It was, how do you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it depended on the teacher. <laughs> they didn't all like me. But uh, but definitely, like, um, yeah, I think I was one of those kids where, like, your essay would get read, read to the whole class, and it was kind of embarrassing, but I secretly, like, loved it, you know? And uh, I a lot of that I do kind of lend itself to mom, mom and my aunts, all my aunties' um, experience as artists, because while my mom was making, you know, making her work, my dad... Um, at the beginning of her career was really selling her as, as, as a personality, as a person, um, you know, when they made that move from, from going to the trading post to going to galleries, it was a really hard sell initially because it was a really, it was very hard. I think for those gallery owners to see Navajo weavers as people, as artists, as someone, they, they wanted to just talk to the traders. And so watching my dad and my mom really sell her and the idea of her and this new concept um, I remember being like in parking lots watching them, you know, really hustle and and really have to convince and debate and explain to people very quickly, you know, what they were about, what their culture was, what the art they were making was and why it was important. And so when I got out here as a television writer, 
it was really easy to start pitching and to start <laughs> kind of talking and, and pitching ideas and stories because I had sort of been doing it my whole life growing up as an Indian market baby. Um, and then also having so much access to curators. I think curators are such fascinating people because their job is really to encapsulate whole movements of art and different pieces and objects and the importance of them, the importance of them and the times that they're made. Um, and so having so much access to curators, I think at a young age and seeing how they interpreted my family's work was always really fascinating to me. And so then you kind of have that experience all summer and then you go back to school and you have to write an essay. You're kind of like, oh, okay, I kind of know how to do this because I've been doing it all summer. I've been talking to people in the booth, trying to convince them to buy my pieces or my brother's pieces or my family's work. Um, and also really like coming against people who would come to our booth ready to judge us and make us feel like we were less than. There was a lot of people who would look at my mom's work and say, oh, I can get that, you know, I can get that in Shiprock for $200. And my mom would be like, well, go to Shiprock. Like she was so <laughs> confident. And the way she sort of carried herself, I think really lended itself to that kind of storytelling element that is my job now. Yeah. And I think Sarah really came into her own when she um, um, started working at NMAI in, in DC. And, um, you know, we would tell her, um, make sure, you know, you um, uh, um, do every once in a while do it too gray, you know, because she was doing all kinds of um, uh, different kinds of uh, um, designs for with her weaving. Um, and she did like Pac-Man and she did, <laughs> you know, all kinds of stuff. And then one time we were so excited because she started a too gray. And then halfway in between, she put something else in, be in between and then finished as a two gray. And, and it was like, you know, <laughs> she learned that, you know, you weave what you see. You know, and, and then do you remember that? Yeah, yeah I do. I had moved to Washington, D.C. because really, like, you know, before then I wove. I wove um, to make sure I knew how. But you know, I always say like I wove and my, my brother is a weaver, you know, um, and a lot of it was just anxiety, I think, of, of worrying you weren't going to match up to how big your family was and how talented they were. And so I just kind of bailed on it. I really froze. And then when I was in Washington, D.C. and moving away for the first time, it was an internship that turned into a job. I really um, missed the sound of weaving. I missed you know, touching warp strings and, and smelling wool. And, and I remember my mom talking about moving to Phoenix and being really homesick and wanting to come home back to the res and her mom bringing her a loom. And I was like, Hey, can you mail me a loom and some wool? And she's like, sure. You know? So she, she, she mailed me one and it was just fun to kind of weave <laughs> freely. I didn't have to like match up to anyone. I didn't have anyone walking by me with a tape measure. I could just like <laughs> sort of figure out on my own, you know, what I wanted it to look like and what I wanted to do. And I was also reading a lot about different um, Navajo weavers at the museum. There's, you know, a huge collection and just wa looking at all the rugs because anytime I was homesick, I would go and look like, oh, you know, there's this rug, this rug. And so, um, and so, yeah, I read from, I forget, I think D.Y. Begay talking about using uh, landscapes as your as your palette, you know, like reenacting. Re so I was taking pictures of like cherry blossoms and all these things in DC, like what does a DC rug look like? And um, it's very humid in Washington, DC. And so I'd started this two gray and I was doing a really good job and I was really excited. And then the humidity hit and it just sunk. <laughs> so my like middle was not my middle anymore. Like one day I woke up and it was just two inches lower and I didn't know what to do. It was a little bit of a sitcom situation. And so I didn't want to ask my mom for help. And so I just added like a giant bar in the middle, <laughs> all these like designs and stuff. And my mom was like, what did you do? You like, you ruined your two gray. And I'm like, it's an artistic choice. But really it was <laughs> they didn't know that I was supposed to be more mindful of that. Um, and so that's why it looks like that, but it sold and it looked really good. And I was really proud of it. And I was, and I was like, it's like the city, it's like a subway system, you know, where <laughs> designs going on and I had a whole, I had a whole backstory for it, but, um, but I got to weave really freely. And every time I finished, my mom would like send me another loom. And I was like really proud of the fact that like, and some of those rugs got me, you know, from DC to my move to Los Angeles. 
every time I really needed to make a big move, I lived, moved to Chicago randomly. Um, I was always able to sell a rug right before, and it always kind of got me to that next place. And I really felt like kind of proud because that was how I was raised with my mom, putting my dad through pharmacy school and us living sort of rug to rug for many years. I, I was always really like proud that that was a way that I was able to kind of achieve my overall um, kind of occupational dreams. No, she didn't say it was sweet. She said it was cherry blossoms. Well, the, the <laughs> first one was cherry blossoms. <laughs> the other one was, yeah. No, 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 but yeah, for sure. And, and you keep a loom in your office, right? I do. I have a loom in my office, and, and I like to, I, I have kids, sons now, and so I'm more into weaving so that they will hear me weave. Um, we had family members who had fallen ill over the pandemic, and I wove just so they could hear the sound of it. Um, I, I do weave in that regard, but I don't weave enough. I will say that I can hear my grandma yelling at me, um, in my head constantly. <laughs> like, the joke we always say is like, I could win an Emmy. I could like become an astronaut and she would be like, are you weaving? So in our, in our head, it's, it's never enough. So. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for her? <laughs> oh, okay. You want to do that? Sure. Yeah. So uh, for those who don't know, because who has a peacock subscription um my show is called rutherford falls it uh, aired for two seasons um and uh it's about a museum workers it's about two um mus people who love museums one native one white and them having this best friendship but also this sort of shared history that they have to contend with um i was such an honor to make this show because it really got to utilize not just my experience as a native woman but also my love of native art i find that especially in hollywood native art is sort of really really underestimated and often mocked in a way that's very annoying to me and so this was our episode oddly about representation um it's sort of a spoof on a show a little show called yellowstone that i do not enjoy um where constantly uh, so many of the native writers on my show myself included have been invited to be cultural consultants and we are always some of us have done it some of us haven't and so this is the episode where Regan, one of the main characters, is asked to go to New York City to be a cultural consultant. And that is sort of what the cold open will be. Um, it turns out that, you know, her and her counterpart, her boss, this guy Terry, um, it's impossible for them to kind of properly advise them on the show because they really don't want their information. And so the last part is the result, which is they make the show so offensive that it gets uh, canceled <laughs> early. <laughs> and so the second clip you'll see is actually an outtake of Regan um, discovering what her boss has done and all the alts that Janish meeting who plays her and improv uh, in a very funny way. So hope you enjoy it. you do this this is chief nightpipe's land last i checked his name wasn't on the deed remington you white men think a piece of paper means you can own mother earth that's right to you the forests on his land are just a bunch of trees but to his people those are his grandfathers and grandmothers they lead him along the red road and they're not for sale Holt. <laughs> god damn it they're not for sale i guess nightpipe jr didn't get the memo we just agreed to terms. He's rich, and the land is mine. What have you done, my son? The ancestors are crying. I had no other choice. You monster. After all we've done to erase these people, can't you see? They're noble keepers of the land. If you have anything more to say, I suggest you lawyer up. He already has. <laughs> <laughs> offensive and dumb like i will truly never understand why people love this show why indians love this show wait why are we watching this show the producers of adirondack a show with a 90 percent audience score on rotten tomatoes have contacted the minishanka nation asking for our guidance on one of their episodes uh. first we offer them script notes then we say why don't you shoot the next season on our res spend some of that sweet location budget here and then before you know it everyone wants to film here and the all native pitch perfect seven gets shot in this Casino. Weird dream, bud. Uh, but this affects me how? Pack your bags. 
you and I will travel to New York City to work on season three of Adirondack. We're going to be cultural consultants. Ugh. Well, now my ancestors are crying. <laughs> charge and suddenly we're on the it's a small world ride terry what the hell i leave you in charge and all of a sudden we're in fucking dances with wolves <laughs> terry what the hell i leave you in charge and suddenly we're in a clint eastwood fever dream <laughs> terry what the hell i leave you in charge and all of a sudden we're in our ancestors curse <laughs> oh god terry what the hell i leave you in charge and we're in a John Wayne mushroom trip? <laughs> Terry, what the hell? I leave you in charge and all of a sudden all the... It, all of Italy is employed? <laughs> I leave you in charge and suddenly we're in a... Johnny Depp microdose? <laughs> Terry, what the hell? I leave you in charge and you make an anti-pollution commercial? Isn't it horrific? <laughs> 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 Good job, baby. <laughs> Thank you, Sierra. That yeah. no, was Thank great. You so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That is all of our collective uh, rage coming out in comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shazia, for being a part of this and for sharing your story. Yeah. Of course. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much for Andrew for, for pushing to, to make this happen. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, do we have more questions? I don't know. I'm looking at the run of show. I don't want to. Yeah. Um, is anybody... No, we're, we have to move on to Michael. Okay, perfect. Um, yes. Well, thank That's... you so much. Yeah. Bye. Baby. Bye, sweetie. And okay. here you are. What happened? Oh, and it'll come back. Yeah. There. Okay. okay. This is ours. This, uh, these these are, Sierra's, are uh, Sierra's weavings. And um, the Pac-Man that I was telling you, is, there's there's two panels. This is the one we're talking about with the, the two gray with the middle um, um, designs. She said they were cherry blossoms, but then today she says traffic. So, <laughs> and then this um, this one here is two panels. Um, the purple one is thinking about the green one, and on the other panel, the green one is thinking about the purple. And she called it uh, forbidden love, and <laughs> and uh, she posted on Facebook and. Um, somebody from the Hood Museum came and, and, and at bought Dartmouth. the set. Yeah, at Dartmouth. So the, so she just comes up with these ideas, and she, um, thankfully, she made it too great here, <laughs> which I'm really grateful for. And um, this piece here, she called it um, Iron Man, you know, like um, not the movie Iron Man. <laughs> it's a different version. And um, she was on her first job, and her first job was uh, Happy Endings. And um, she was in the writer's room when I called her and told her she won first prize. And she was so excited, and everybody, all the writers are like, get on the plane, go, you know. Mm -hmm. So she came to Santa Fe for this, and she was more excited because I got second. <laughs> <laughs> She goes, I knew it. She goes, it's time, Mom. Your days are over. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my son, Michael. Michael, you know, when I was a kid, my grandmother used to say that you were born to be a weaver, that this is, this is your calling, this is what you do, and that you were blessed by the weaving gods. And I never really believed it. I'm just like... Yeah, yeah, you know, you just want me, you're just saying this because you want me to weave. <laughs> and, but when uh, Mikey was 11, 
um, he came to me, he was, because he was watching his sister weave and her and I were struggling because Sierra knew everything about weaving. <laughs> and so he came and he said, why don't you teach me? You know, I would like to learn. And I thought, why not? You know, we've always had men weavers. Um, you know, when our dad was at the trading post, he would, um, um, these men weavers would bring in their pieces. And then my dad would say, "Who would, whose name do you want me to put, you know, on your piece? And then they'd say, well, put my mom's name or my aunt or my sister's, you know, because there was a stigma against male weavers. And then so my mom and uh, our Aunt Margaret always had this running joke about there's a lot of famous weavers that have never woven in their lives because, <laughs> you know, their husbands or their sons were the weavers. You know? So I started teaching him and it was like he was born to do this. You know, I understood that. I understood that he... I didn't have to tell him twice, but he was already thinking it by the time I was finished explaining to him what to do, you know. And um, he started out making two grades and on his own. And lot, some of them he designed on the computer, and which is like, oh, my God, you can't do that, you know, because, <laughs> you know, and he was like, Mom, you know, we're novels. We, know, we learn how to adapt. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, so I have to now I'm not allowed to in his workroom until he's over half. So, I don't have to say you should change it here or you should do this. So, you know, I'm kind of banned from his his workroom. But he started doing um uh, pieces like this and he called on the, and uh, his Iron Man weavings and he he loves comics. And he takes the colors from the comics and puts them into his weaving. And we were at Santa Fe Indian Market, and some guy came up and they asked him, what style of weaving is this? And then he goes, it's a Mike and Ornelas rug, right? And the guy goes, no, no, what region? Where are you from? Where did this come from? And he goes, I came from Tucson, and this is a Michael Ornelas weaving. <laughs> and, you know, it, it dawned on me then that, I can do that too, you know. I don't have to be a strictly a two gray hill weaver. I can go out. Yeah, I mean, I was already doing that, but it kind of gave me permission to accept that part of my my weaving, you know, history. Um, and these are our seventh generation. Um, our older sister Roseanne. Um, had two, uh, had three boys actually, and uh, the middle boy we we lost him um, to COVID in 2020, and he was our chief um, tool maker, and uh, um, he and his former wife had a daughter in Germany, and we didn't see her for a whole year, and so when she, when we finally saw her, we rubbed um, uh, spider webs in her, on her palms so that she would become a weaver. And so every year she entered the youth division at Santa Fe Indian Market, and she always won first place every year until she was 17. And then she um, uh, um, uh, she entered the Navy after age 18. Um, but she was, she was a fearless weaver. I would tell her, uh, please do this, or you know, maybe you should wait on doing columns. She goes, I don't see why not. <laughs> she was just... She, she was as fearless and I just enjoyed uh, teaching her and um, uh, hopefully after she finishes up with with the other things in, in her life right now she she has asked for a weaving over Thanksgiving so she she said uh, please send me a loom and um, and I think she's really lonely for that as well and then this is Sierra's first uh, son um, Javier he's now six and he's about three right now and he has his own loom already his comb is ready to go and he has a younger brother named Conrad who's two months old and he'll get his own loom and tools <laughs> and the weaving line's never gonna die <laughs> And, uh, you know, all of this would not be possible without the tool makers in our family and the loom makers. And uh, Belvin is my husband, and he came from a weaving family, and he is also a mechanical engineer. And so he has really worked to make um, our looms 
as portable and as uh, efficient as possible. And a lot of times when I set up my loom, people look at me and they go, oh, you're not sitting on the floor. And I said, None of, nobody in our family sits on the floor because it's really hard on your body. We need back supports. We need foot supports. And, you know, uh, weaving is going to be in our lives for a very long time. And you don't want your body to break down. And he has really come a long way in, in designing our, our looms and um, uh, our tools. And I mentioned Terry, who uh, uh, was uh, Roxanne's father. He was left-handed. And uh, we used to take him to classes with us and he would listen to people's challenges and he would develop a tool for them. And he was left-handed, so he created a tool that could be used for left-handers and right-handers. And he was just amazing. And it was such a, a loss to the weaving community when he passed. But uh, we do honor his memory. Um, uh, Roxanne's going to be weaving. We're going to be using his tools. And... Really, tool makers are such a big part of our lives as weavers, and we never talk about them. And we hope that uh, when you see the exhibit, you go look at the tool, um, the, the tool section. And we thank you so much <clears throat> for allowing us to tell you our stories. Um, I, and we have a lot more. <laughs> so you'll be here all night. <laughs> And thank you so much. Yeah. We have time for just a few questions. No, but only because we're about to come out of hands from the long so the closer we can get you, we can go to the back. Um, we're really well known for high weft counts. Um, there are a lot of weavers on the Navajo Nation and off the Navajo Nation, and a lot of them use commercial wool. And the commercial wool that is used is really thick and heavy. There's very few people, and especially from our community of uh, Newcomb and Tugra Hill communities on the Navajo Nation that weave um, very finely. And so a lot of times um, our pieces do not end up in galleries or trading posts. We sell directly to uh, collectors. And so um, a lot of times our pieces aren't really out there on the market. And, uh, but we do take a lot of commissions and we sell it that way. And our style is so distinctive that really muse some museum people um, can recognize our work right away. Like if I go to, to um, um, an event or something or I, I get invited to a collector's home, I can always see my mom's pieces I can I recognize them I see my sister's work and they're so distinctive but some weavers do put like their initials at the bottom or they'll put like some kind of symbol like feathers and all kinds of stuff but our family we don't do that There, um, sure. Um, the The museum is the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. It's on Museum, Muse, museum Hill. Um, it's right next to the Folklore Museum. And Horizons Woven Between the Lines will open July sixteenth, and it will be there till June of twenty twenty four. Thank you. And there will be a catalog. Another thank you. You mentioned your tight weft count, but what is, what is your your what are your ends per inch? Is that a standard you use, or does that vary by design? Um, 
our, our ends per inch, um, it varies according to the projects that we do. So the manta that I'm working on, my ends per inch is actually 12. And what Barbara is doing over there is, what, seven times two, uh, 14. She's, she's doing a 14. And, and hers is higher because all of her wefts that she's using are hand spun and hand, hand carded and hand spun. I'm using a mixture of um, commercial and hand spun. And I also use plant dyes like uh, rabbit brush and, a, and a, um, a dye extract for the turquoise. And that puffs up my wool. So my weft count here is about 114. And but what Barbara's doing over there is about 120, I believe. Great. Any other questions? Oh, oh thank you. Hi. Also, thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, learning to do the patterns as young children? Do they ever put the design behind the loom? Um, I, I have never seen that done. Yeah. And right now you're, um, you know, doing the designs uh, as you weave. So I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, as, as youngsters, um, we had to incorporate a lot of math. And um, the math is, you know, you, you have to count your warps. Um, we, you just don't decide, like, I'm going to use 40 warps. That's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And in our creation stories, um, we, uh, when first man and first woman were created, there were two of them. And so they could never agree on anything. And so the, the holy people get, uh, created um, Coyote. And Coyote made a third person. And that Coyote would side with either. And so when we warp, we have to make sure that we have an exact middle. So if, let's say I choose 50, 50 uh, divided by two is 25, 25 is an odd number, and it's going to give me a center. And when we do two grays, two grays are identical with four quadrants, and you have to do your math, you have to measure. So we, uh, we grew up with a lot of math, geometry, and all of that stuff, and, um, uh, and we, you learn it as a, as a child or otherwise your weaving would all be wonky. <laughs> I have a question, and maybe you talked about it or not, but um, I've, heard, I've read about uh, a concept called the spirit line. Um, is that something that's been utilized in your tradition in uh, the specific work that you're making? Um, not every weaver adheres to that. Uh, weaving families are um, different. Uh, most weaving families have their own beliefs, and um, those lines have always been evident in bordered rugs, like Barbara is weaving a bordered rug. She has uh, two, uh, three sets of colors in her border. She has a black, gray, and white, and then her inside fill color is that red-brown that is our signature color for our two grays. At the end, at the top red corner, that last um, red-brown that you see will go out out towards the black and come back in. That's our uh, weaver's path. We call it a weaver's path and not a spirit trail. Um, and that signifies that we are spider woman and that's our spider web leading out. And it leads us to the next rug and it leads us to the next rug. Uh, because as a spider web, we are creating our web of tapestries. And when our mother was done weaving, uh, she made four pieces for all of us children. And I'm the last one. The one that she wove for me does not have her line because her line ended. And with that, please join me in thanking Barbara and Linda and Belvin and Sierra and Hadley for this beautiful evening. And thank you all so much for joining us.